This is the Real Estate Power Play Podcast, getting you the information that you need to be a successful real estate investor. Hosted by Mark Monroe, Ronnie Walker, Gabe Rodarte, and me, Marty Grizzani. Combined, we've done thousands of real estate transactions. So get ready for real stories and true case studies on finding deals, growing portfolios, and making money. Welcome to the show. Hello, 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 everybody. Thank you guys all coming to Real Estate Power Play. Uh, we go live every Tuesday um, at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We used to go noon and we had a recording, but now we're actually recording stuff live because we're getting a lot of people um, engaging, asking questions uh, whenever we have guests on or if we're talking. So if you're listening to us or watching us now, please share. If you're listening to any of you on your favorite podcast, please like, share, and we'll go from there. But uh, today, I am super excited. We have Nick on from, um, I always say, uh, Pad Split. <laughs> I always get that yeah. backwards. How are you doing, Nick? You doing all right. right? Mark, how are you? Doing wonderful. Doing wonderful. How was your uh, holiday weekend? It was great. It got a lot of sun. We had fantastic weather out here in Colorado. So it was nice to, you know, get some mental clarity and get back into work. How about you? Yeah. So, yeah, it was nice. It was, uh, I live in Florida and, uh, you know, you guys, Memorial Day is the nice time of year and where well, you guys are up north and in the mountains. So it's kind of like, you know, for us, that's like October Halloween from Halloween on for us. It's like, yay. You know, I lived up north. So I know up in Vermont, I grew up in the mountains. So Memorial Day was always a special, it's the beginning of the beautiful weather, enjoying it, you know, allergy season with a, you know, all that stuff. So, well, thanks for coming back on. We actually, I had you on in my coaching call and we actually forgot to hit co um, record during that session so i'm glad that you're back on so i can actually uh, get this over to uh, my students in the group yeah. so thanks for much for coming back on i love this model and that's why i wanted to kind of get you back on especially uh for you listeners this is an amazing exit strategy uh, to if you're doing like a, a seller financing if you're going to rent it hold it as a rental um even if you want to acquire it through what's called a lease option uh, i call it sandwich lease option is like an arbitrage where you actually go under contract with a seller as a as a lease option or a rent to own allowing you to sublet it and run it as any type of situation or if you already have um, a property that you're currently owning now and you want to kind of maximize your profit so this is an amazing model and nick i'm just going to kind of let you jump in and i'll probably ask you some questions along the way yeah, I appreciate that. You know, we've been working with a lot of creative financing students um, over the past year specifically because we might be a model they not have, they might have not have heard of. You know, they do a lot of short term rentals, maybe long term rentals, but we kind of fit in the middle and we can maximize a lot of assets that you never would have thought possible. Right. Your B and C class areas. And we'll dig into that in a little bit. Um, but no, it's always a pleasure to be on with you, Mark. And I appreciate people like you who offer people, you know, so many creative solutions in real estate in general. And, you know, candidly, that's what I'm trying to do as an investor myself. I'm trying to find out some new creative solutions to build my portfolio. So thank you for having me and thank you for doing what you do. I appreciate it. All right. I'll go ahead and share the screen here. So you guys are listening. We're going to try to uh, be detailed as possible if you're listening on the podcast, but we're actually pulling up some slides and we'll try to explain everything so you can listen to it. But if you have some questions and you want to go back and look at some of these slides afterwards, you can go over to the uh, YouTube channel, uh, Real Estate Power Play. We are live now, so you don't have to give it a couple of weeks um, and then our uh, editing team will get it up live. But go ahead. Um, I'm going to share the screen now for you, Nick. Absolutely. And, and I'll be sure to, to explain it too for your listeners. So Pad Split, who we are in a nutshell, this is the thousand foot view of our company, essentially. So we're the world's largest uh, workforce co-living company. Um, we're in about 14 cities now. This is an outdated slide. So the people listening will hear the updated numbers. We have about 7,000, I think 7,200 units, which is the bedrooms we rent on our platform. Um, and we have about 17,000 tenants in our marketplace, uh, which we call members. So it's really cool to see the growth over the past. You know, we were founded in 2018. So whatever that math is, it's really cool to see the growth. People are really adopting medium term solutions now with these higher interest rates. You need to outperform interest rates. Yields are compressing. So we're something that maximizes that potential um, for a lot of your properties. So these are some of the cities and, and I'll highlight these uh, verbally as well. So Atlanta is our founding city in 2018. We were founded there. Um, it's our largest city. We have the biggest market share there. Um, really incredible outcomes. 
Uh, just a side note, I had someone who listed a property, six bedrooms on the east side of Atlanta, and it filled up in 24 hours. So really, really cool response there. Um, circling around the map, we'll start north. We'll go Kansas City, uh, Baltimore, which are two brand new markets for us. Richmond, which is more of an established market. Moving down to um, you know Mark's area of Florida, we're down in Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, and Miami. Miami is opening up this year. New Orleans, Dallas markets. We have Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. And then going out west, we have Phoenix and Las Vegas. So these are the core markets that we're in. And we'll get into a little bit later why these are important. Um, essentially, we were, we're full bore there. We have all our marketing pieces in place. So again, what we are is we're the nation's largest shared housing marketplace. And, and the way I like to think about it is it's a two-sided marketplace. You as the investor have your property you can list. You can list your rooms for them with a description and a picture. The other side of that is the workforce that we um, cultivate and, and enroll into Padsplit. So our mission is to leverage housing as a vehicle for financial empowerment while helping solve the affordable housing crisis one room at a time. Um, and it's really important to note that the unaffordable housing crisis is, is a big problem. But, you know, that sh that target demographic is someone that no one's really tackled before. Right. It can be really challenging learning how to learn the ropes in that industry. And we've done a, a tremendous job um, in order to, you know, bring one, bring them out of poverty, give them more affordable solutions and provide our investors with uh, a tenant base, which is the workforce. So we really combine all those things into one. Um, again, our biggest value prop is a technology that PadSplit provides. We're a two-sided dashboard, like I mentioned before, but the technology is what, a, what allows investors to scale. It allows someone like me who lives in Colorado to own two PadSplit properties, one in Atlanta and one in Orlando. Um, I have 12 tenants to my name, and I never thought that would ever be possible, but PadSplit makes it very possible for you know anyone at any level of, of real estate investing to kind of capitalize on that. We have someone like a mom and pop, a small investor like myself who owns two properties, and our biggest client is a family office based out of New York that does $30 million a year um, in, in finding and renovating PadSplit properties. So we work with every wow. spectrum. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. How long ago did they start with you all? They were very early adopters. I want to say 2020, they started um, They started in the Atlanta market and the Jacksonville market. So they acquire off-market properties, buy, renovate, get them on the pad split um, platform and, and, you know, take in the cash flow essentially. But yeah, predominantly Atlanta and Jacksonville markets, um, they find a lot of good off-markets there. So it, it's impressive what they do. So what we do, PadSplit's biggest value prop, again, is that technology piece, but what comes with that technology piece, right? So you have marketing. Um, we do the marketing in all of our core areas, uh, paid marketing, right? I always have an, uh, investors and people come to me saying, oh, okay, I can utilize your platform, but what about the marketing piece? We do that as well, which is a major value prop. Uh, member screening, background check, credit check, employment verification, member management, so we handle member disputes, move in, move out times, payments and collections is probably the biggest thing that I think is most valuable of what we do. Our collections team collects on a 97% rate throughout our platform. Um, and, and, you know, we, we have late fees assessed that go directly to the, the investor. Our, our payments collection team just does a really, really good job of, of you know, centralizing all that. We also have onboarding and consultation, and that's what my role is as a, a sales rep in pads. But I essentially get you from step zero to cash flowing property operating every month. Right. So I'm with you every step of that process, whether you want to acquire new properties, we can go through buy boxes in different areas. If you have existing inventory in an area that we're already located in, we can see if it fits well. I can run an analysis and give you some numbers on it. And my job is to really be like a concierge, a pads, but concierge is how I like to refer myself. So who is who is renting from Pat? Who is renting pad split rooms? Right. Who is the workforce that I keep talking about? A lot of people give me that question. And the way I like to lay it out is like anyone making 30 to 50 K in India, any industry really is our target demographic. Someone looking for a more affordable option in the city that they work in um, is who we want to rent pad split rooms. So some of these people work at, you know, your airports, your FedEx operations, your Amazon facilities, that blue collar workforce who needs more affordable options. That's essentially our, our target demographic. And again, why do they go to Padsplit instead of renting rooms? You know, we have rooms on the platform um, in Houston and in Jacksonville where there already are some affordable options, right? A one bedroom, one bath um, apartment in, in Houston is pretty affordable. 
But what we do offer is all utilities included. We offer no first and last month's payment, which a lot of um, apartments have to you have to have. And we don't have a minimum credit score. So those are some incentives that we can offer that other places don't. And even though the baseline revenue is probably the same, you know, a one bedroom, one bath is still affordable. You still don't get all those options that PadSplit can offer. So that's why people ch tend to choose to rent with PadSplit and we can keep our rooms more filled um, than a lot of other, you know, platforms. So again, what we do for our customer, for our tenants is we provide furnished bedrooms. Uh, we provide utilities. We provide telemedicine services, employment services, credit score boosting, 24-7 member support, a ton of incentives for our member side. And the reason we do that is, is because we want to keep these rooms filled and we want to keep our investors happy, right? So we're when we're aligning both of those incentives, PadSplit essentially is doing its job correctly. Now, this is a this is an interesting, you know, a lot of people come and, and when I'm talking about PadSplit, they say, what does PadSplit manage? Are you guys full property management? You know, do you take the trash out? Things like this. What PadSplit does is it generates and screens tenants and it manages collections and member disputes, right? What the host is responsible for, what you as the investor are responsible for is the physical side of your asset, which is a good, good way to think about it, right? You are acquiring or you're using active inventory. You're typically doing some sort of renovation. You're furnishing the property and then you're listing it on PadSplit. And then PadSplit takes over that piece that deals with the tenants, right? As far as cleaning and lawn maintenance and those physical sides, that would again be on the, the investor. So there is some differentiation there. Um, some people put additional property management on it. Both of my properties, I do I do one of each. In my Atlanta property, I have property management that does the physical side. They actually handle my dashboard too. So it's as passive as you could possibly be. If you're an investor that wants to be completely hands-off and just take a check-in, that's something you can do. My Orlando property, I actually self-manage that one. So when I get a maintenance ticket on the uh on the platform, you know, they say there's a leaky sink, leaky sink in the second bathroom. I send a plumber out there. So I'm a little more hands-on. Saving a little bit more percentage, but it is more hands on. So just to just to let you understand, there's a couple ways you can you can utilize this. Now, this is something that I wish your podcast guests could see. Um, and I would I would highly suggest to go back and find the video recording of this. If you're if you're if you're listening, um, you need to go back and see this slide. This is a slide that's very this, powerful. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. It, this is what really this is what really gets me like. And if you can see it. Um, it's just an example. It just shows a house diagram, and this particular house is a four bedroom. Uh, was it two bath? I'm assuming three bath, possibly. Uh, four bed, three bath originally. Got it. So originally, right? So this is just awesome. So this is a regular residential home, four bedroom, three bath. Um, but I'll let you kind of explain what you did here uh, when you went through the construction. But this is just this word right here is just so powerful. Yeah, this is the thing that's super interesting. And when I first found out about pads, what that appealed the most to me was like, okay, you're really utilizing a multifamily model on a single family asset. And what I mean is we're converting common areas. Now, traditionally, if you have single family rentals, your, your, your dining room and your living room provide diminishing returns. They get damaged by tenants over time. If you have a you know, a core family with two kids, kids are going to damage those areas. People are going to leave bags in the living room table and the dining room table. So our thought in pad split is instead of blocking these rooms off or accepting those diminishing returns, you can optimize that square footage and make it into a unit. So converting a dining room into an additional bedroom and converting a living room into additional bedroom. Now in this model, instead of operating with four beds, you convert those and, you know, we actually split the fourth bedroom to get another one. So you have seven total bedrooms on the house uh, with three baths. Now, what that does is twofold. You're maximizing that square footage and you're collecting much more net revenue than you would before on a single family rental. So you're really exploding that net revenue without doing too much work, right? A lot of the thought process to assess the affordability crisis has been to build. Right. And we tried to build through COVID and then we had supply shortage chain, chain issues. Um, so it's been a very slow and costly process doing that. Our CEO's thought was, you know, we don't have to build. We have existing square footage in this older inventory built in the 70s. These homes were overbuilt at the time. Everyone wanted, you know, twenty five hundred, three thousand square foot for a family of three to four, which is just honestly too much space in a lot of the cases. So now we're utilizing this, converting them to additional bedrooms and operating on that unit count, right? Again, multifamily model on a single family asset. 
Um, your acquisition is much more attainable because you're in the single family sphere. So you can typically acquire for, for a lower cost than a multifamily property. But now you're utilizing the multifamily model and you're getting those multifamily returns. Um, hopefully I explained that well, Mark, you know, you can feel to, feel free to pop in there if you want to. Again, it's a very powerful image. Um, and I like to explain it because, you know, it's just something that I thought was super interesting when I ventured into pad split. It really is. So you're taking the living room and you're converting it to two more bedrooms, but you're also taking one of the bigger bedrooms and making it a little smaller to create another room. Is that what you're doing here? That's what we did here. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. No, it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Like it's just, so just think of a house. If anybody's listening, think of a house and you see how a living room is and they're just building, they're putting, splitting it up and adding two more bedrooms to it. It's just, it, it's amazing. I thought that was genius. Yeah. And, and what a lot of people do and what I've done in the past is, is typically frame it out like you normally would. Right. So drywall framing, uh, you put a door there. Mostly, typically it's just 90 degrees, two walls um, for an addition. You're not adding electricity. You're not adding HVAC. So it's a very temporary solution, but it feels standard. Right. You walk in there, it feels like, oh, the house was made like this. But you could essentially take those walls down if you wanted to exit strategy to sell a single family. And I always tell my GCs this. I'm like, hey, guys, look. I need you to build these walls and make these additional rooms, but I need to be able to take them down in two weeks if I want to sell this at a single family value. Right. So it's a very temporary solution that feels more fixed, um, but it serves a great purpose. All right. So and this is what I didn't show you last time, Mark. This is a little bit of a surprise. So our marketing team came up with a new slide, which is essentially the same idea. Right. Um, for podcast listeners, this is adding additional bedrooms, um, but now we have the underwriting next to it so we can see the net profit. And I'll work through it a little bit here um, just to go through this example. So the traditional rental was a 3-1, uh, three bedrooms, one bath, purchase price was 210, and we converted it to a 5-2. So we added a bedroom and we added we added two bedrooms and one bath. Again, purchase price is still 210, but your, your property and upfront investment is 45K for that conversion. So your total investment instead of two thousand ten dollars is two um, two hundred and ten thousand. Excuse me, is now two fifty five. So that's your all in cost. Now the interesting thing is you can see how the annual rental income is just about three x. So instead of fourteen thousand dollars, you're talking about thirty six thousand um, dollars. There are some additional costs, right? You have a pad split fee. You have your utilities. So those costs are going to come out of your basis every month and every year. But at the end of the day, um, your net profit is typically double or three times what it would be in a tr traditional single family um, rental. So a little bit more money up front, um, but typically that conversion will pay for itself within a four to six month span. Um, and, and every time I've done underwriting for a pad split deal, it's been well worth it. And again, I just like to reiterate, you know, as far as buy box is concerned for this model, I have a lot of clients who come up to me and they say, oh, I want a 4,000 square foot house that already has six bedrooms. And, and that's not really the case, right? Typically, those are going to be in high class A areas. They're going to be very expensive to acquire. Where our bread and butter is for pad split is those B and C class uh, areas, right? We want to be in a high rental friendly area. We want to be around public transit. We want to be on a corner lot. Um, we want to have availability for parking. But you really want to buy an asset that's two to three to a three two or a four two that you can convert because you're going to be in there for a lower acquisition cost. You're going to have a slight renovation cost, but now you're maximizing that asset. Right. So your cost basis up front is typically much lower than it would be for a four thousand square foot home. Right. You're just being more creative through the process. Uh, that's that's like I like that. I, I, yeah, I didn't see that last time. So. Um, all right. All right. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll let you finish going through and then I'll ask the questions at the end. You know, I what I can typically do or what I do is run through the um, the platform. So, you know, for your for your podcast listeners, they wouldn't be able to see it. I can run through it if you want to. Um, that's up to you. What do you, Which way do you want to go, Mark? Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, you can try explaining it. You know, uh, so people are listening to this uh, through the podcast, but I think people watching it would definitely uh, enjoy it. OK, um, let's, let's do that real quick then. No problem. So was that your last slide? Yep, that was my last slide. OK, because I know last time you actually had some photos, I thought, or was that on your website that we actually saw what it looked like uh, with 
each of the bedrooms look like. I think that yeah, was really I, cool. I do I do so. have that available too. So let's let's go through that actually. So for your podcast listeners, this is a converted house. Um, this is a house in Atlanta, Georgia. Can you see that, Mark? Yeah, I'm yeah. trying. Whoops, there it is. There, there we go. go. Yep, okay. here we go. Yeah, so this is a house in Atlanta, Georgia. It's an active pad split. And what I like to do, um, you know, for your for your visual um, consumers is, is show what the top of the house looks like, right? So we see these houses or these rooms on the outside, you know, kind of are surrounding the asset. Um, I think this was one, you see the ceiling fans are typically the traditional room. So one, two, three, four. And it looks like they converted these two and maybe this room. Um, so they really maximize this asset, but we'll take a we'll take a trip down into inside of it just to see what it looks like. And, and the one thing I like to point out is it's very functional, right? We want to maintain functional workforce housing standards. Um, this is not the amenities game. This is not the hospitality game. So it's not what you would typically do in a short term rental, right? You rely on five star reviews. You rely on creating a crazy, you know, intimate experience that's that's a little bit overwhelming. This is much more functionality. Now, it's not that we don't want to have nice finishes. Um, I think a house like this is beautiful, but you just don't need to have those those um, short term rental finishes, I would say. Exposed fire extinguishers, smoke alarms. That's something that's standard for pets. But we do have some standards that are a little bit different um, as far as onboarding goes. But this is what you were alluding to, Mark. This is the room that they added. So for your audible listeners, this is uh, this is directly across the kitchen. This is the existing dining room area. So what they did is they walled off a section all the way down the hallway and got two additional bedrooms in this, um, what was the dining room area, right? So square footage wise, I think these rooms are about probably over eight by 10, but pretty close to it. So smaller rooms. Um, but again, you know, in the if it's in the Atlanta market, you're probably grossing an additional 14 to $1,600 a month on these two rooms alone. Um, so again, they converted the dining room and the rooms are furnished in pad split. This is what the furnishing looks like. I'll talk through it real quick. So you have a bed, bed frame with a mattress. The picture has pillows and blankets. You don't actually provide those in pad split. The members bring their own, so you don't have to keep washing them and keep up with them, um, which is nice. We have a small table with a light. Um, we have art on the wall. And if you do a room conversion, but don't add a closet, which I would recommend, save on some cost and time, you do need to add some sort of storage, whether that's a storage rack, a dresser, or an armoire. Um, so again, these rooms are furnished, but they're very functionally furnished. Um, last time I priced mine out, I priced my rooms out for about six fifty, I believe, including the uh, including the lock. I, I sourced everything on Amazon actually, and it's been really good success so far. So a couple of things I did want to talk to. I talked about the standard for pad split. So we do have some room standards we need to abide by. Each room does need to have an individual lock. Um, I use smart locks on my door. Some people use lock and key. Some people use punch code locks. I would go smart or punch code. You know, keys tend to go missing. That's what I've found in my experience. So I would stray away from those. Two areas of egress. So if you are doing a room conversion, you need to make sure that you have two areas of egress, which is a door and a window to the outside. Um, HVAC, smoke alarm, smoke detector, and electricity, obviously. And that is that rounds out a standard pad split room that would be checked off through the program. Um, and again, we'll walk through here real quick. And, and podcast listeners, the thing I'm highlighting here is the fact that all the rooms are pretty much the same. Very standardized. Um, we want the idea to be, you know, hotel, motel, uh, apartment style, right? All our rooms are furnished, so we don't have people moving stuff in and out. We don't have people forgetting furniture. We don't have people dinging up drywall. Uh, we want it to be very turnkey. That, that's kind of the goal um, in this investing model. And we'll pop in here to one of the common bathrooms. Nothing special here, but just to elude that, you know, the bathroom's extremely functional. Everything looks really nice, too. So, Mark, any thoughts on this asset itself as a pad split? No, I think that's great. Uh, so... They did build closets. So what they did is it created a rack uh, that you get where you said at Amazon, you create the rack. So, you know, where they can put their belongings. Yes, exactly. So this room does have a okay. closet. But um, when I when I built my rooms out, uh, both of them had racks that I bought off Amazon. Some people do dressers. Some people do armoires. Um, I thought that the price point was nice on this and it's a little more functional than a dresser. So, yeah, a good example of that would be a rack you find on Amazon. 
Got it. Okay. And then they brought the uh, HVAC vent into the unit, so in the heating, so that's cool. And what do they do? So you don't run cable through the whole place. They just do like a Wi-Fi type of thing to hook into a TV if they want. Is that yeah, how you exactly. run it? Like through yep. Okay. Yeah, so they would. You do provide Wi-Fi. You do not have to provide uh, TVs in each room, right? That's sort of the amenity game yeah. that it, it's it's a fine line. I have investors who provide TVs. I have investors who don't. What we found is there's not a big markup in room rent for providing those amenities. So what I do is, you know, I, of course provide the Wi-Fi, but a lot of members who move into my houses bring their own televisions. Um, I've had one bring their own air fryer. So typically. They're going to bring what they want and I'm fine with it, um, but I don't provide televisions or, or things like that. I just I don't really see the return as an investor to do it. And there's too many potential problems with the TV breaking or whatever. So we have a question. I'm sorry. I just wanted somebody before the listener. I'm going to pop it up on the screen and okay. see if you can see that. Uh, can you read that on the screen from yeah. there? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Very advanced question, too. That speaks to uh, who your who your customers are, who your members are in your program. That's a great yeah. question. Um, yeah, we do have people who use the Burr model to take your initial investment out. There's a little bit of a trick behind it. So the trick is to get the single family appraised value before you add the additional bedrooms, right? So you would essentially do the Burr model, do the renovation as a single family home, have the appraiser come out, get the full extracted value, because if they see eight or nine bedrooms in a house, they're not going to know what to do with the appraisal. I've heard appraisals go both ways. I've heard really good appraisals on pad splits and then not great appraisals on pad splits. So in my opinion, and, and I have some um, some investors and some co-workers who have actually have done this. So Burr model, renovation, extract single family value at an appraisal before you add the walls, add the walls later. Um, and we do have some DSCR lending options that are national lenders who understand co-living and understand pad split. So we have some national options that I always love to refer people. Um, I, I recently had a person, an uh, investor of mine in Richmond, use a DSCR loan, get great value and was able to do a refi. Uh, so to answer your question, yes and yes. And we can provide lending options for you. Okay, perfect. Nice. Thanks for uh, that. Great question, by the way. If anybody else has any more questions, feel free to uh, drop them in. Um, so I have a question back to the property. Um, I got a few questions on it. So um, is there a, like a laundry room? Like how does that work about the property? Like how does that model? Like how do they determine on, you know, who uses it? Is it first come first serve or kind of dive into that a little bit? Good question. Uh, we do have, you know, laundries provided in the um you know, as far as your utilities are concerned, laundry is provided. People do have laundry rooms. I have a stackable unit in my Florida property. I have the perfect little corner for it. it goes right in there. Some people do have laundry times per rooms. Um, so you would black out, you know, room one is on Tuesday, whatever you, whatever system you want to implement, you could do it. My thought is like, these are working class adult people. Typically they can figure it out on their own if they want to do laundry in their own time. So I don't have any additional like, um, you know, directions of applied for laundry i usually just provide it and make sure that it you know it's operational and then they can figure out their own timing for laundry it's kind of like when you were in college and you were sharing you know dorm life and you had to find out when you could use the coin operated laundry machine got it okay so we got this other uh document up so if you, anybody's listening to us i'll let you go ahead so this is what the dashboard looks like um and i'll try to talk through it as well um, the thing I want to point out is how centralized and how powerful and user friendly it is for the investor. Right. So what we do is up front, we provide um, actually up front. You know, this person has 10 homes. She does an amazing job. Her story is incredible. She actually moved her family to Europe and survives purely off the revenue and the cash flow that pad split survives. Her whole goal is to build a portfolio. She got to 10 houses within three years. Um, so really, really cool to see that success story. And, and what we see here is you have move ins and move outs, right? 10 assets. She has a lot of room. So she's going to have some fluctuation here. Um, we have people moving in and moving out. It should give you all the details about who's moving in, their financial history. You can further approve and reject them. Um, so it gives you a little more control as the owner. We'll scroll down here and what you'll see is an occupancy snapshot. So this shows you what your um, what your units are currently occupied at. This is a little skewed because she has 58 out of 60 rooms currently occupied, which is much higher than 89%. Um, five of the rooms that are inactive and one pending move in, that kind of goes into that algorithm too. But again, you see an occupancy snapshot when you log into your dashboard. You see a financial snapshot. Um, I always like to brag on her. 
Well, it looks like May was actually better. So her monthly income for May was, you know, right at forty-one thousand uh, dollars, edging on forty-two thousand dollars gross income just from collecting on 10, 10 houses through pad split. So we see a financial snapshot. You have month and year indicators, and you have a little um, bar graph that shows you how you're performing each month. You can see she's very consistent. We'll scroll down here. You'll have dates that you can block out. You know, if you're out of town, you don't want anyone moving in. You can block those dates out. You can set move in days, move in times. Again, it's very centralized to give you as much control as you could possibly want. And we'll scroll down here and we'll see her list of assets. Um, and we'll click into one of the houses just to give you a quick look. Um, again, we, we, we see income and occupancy for this um, specific asset. We'll scroll down and we'll see who's occupying the rooms and the weekly dues that go coincide with that room as well as a picture. Um, and I also mentioned maintenance tickets earlier. So, you know, everyone who lives in the pad split essentially can communicate to each other through the app. They can also submit maintenance tickets through the app. So, you know, they can, this little, there's a, uh, there's a wrench icon at the top. And when someone wants to say, Hey, you know, the sink is leaking in bathroom number two, you need to address that. So you'll get that maintenance ticket or your property manager will get that maintenance ticket and you can address it quicker. And one thing I love to talk about is, you know, people initially say one of the objections I get is, oh, wow, seven people living in one house want to get torn up. And what we found is it's actually the opposite. So people who tear houses up in single family homes are typically, you know, mothers and fathers with two children. I know my brother and I went through drywall and windows like it was going out of style. Uh, but when you're in a co-living um, facility, you share that room with other people. You share the common areas with other people. So you tend to respect it. And if you have an issue, you're going to have seven different sets of eyeballs seeing, hey, the sink is the sink is leaking. We need to address this issue. You can now address that issue much quicker than, say, a single family rental that has a leaky sink for two years. And now you have a huge problem with, you know, foundation or whatever other water issues can happen. So just a little story I like to say. And it's kind of an interesting thought process and, and psychology that goes into that. So I got a question on that because you mentioned there that's kind of, um, you know, seven people living in a home, right? What kind of situations like if people don't get along or like, hey, you know what, somebody's sitting there and they're in the kitchen and every time they go in, like what, tell me how you guys handle that. Like what I'm assuming stuff when you have seven people, you know, I'm sure you have some situations that pop up. Yeah, of course. The one we always like to say is like, Jimmy ate my peanut butter, right? Like it's always some small situation that should be easily resolvable, but you have seven different personalities. Of course, you're going to have some natural clashing that exists. Um, so what we do is we try to mitigate that from the front end, right? So we have the app padsplit.com where they can all communicate with each other. Typically, smaller issues get resolved through that, just through communication through the app. So they can say, hey, you know, so-and-so you left your laundry out. If you could pick that up, great. That's the that's step one. Step two is a customer service team. So if something escalates further than that, um, it'll actually get pushed to our customer support team. They can then, you know, talk to the members and try to get it resolved. If it escalates further than that, if two people just can't live together and we've had this situation happen, um, we can actually transfer one of the members to another existing pad split. So we can remove the situation from the house, kind of de-escalate everything and move someone to another pad split, you know, in the same town. Um, so they're still in the same recent area, but, you know, you kind of avoid that issue. So those are three things we do to mitigate, you know, people not getting along or, or small fights. Okay. All right. I, I have some more questions, but we'll let you finish up the dashboard here. Oh, that's that's uh, I'm done with the dashboard. Just wanted to show you the you know finances, what it looks like operating a portfolio and bumping into a house to kind of give you a, a good a good idea of what it looks like to operate it. Uh, that's awesome. That's that's good stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's really, really powerful. So back to, uh, you know, as us as investors or us as the homeowners, I'm thinking like, you know, what how we would think. So. Um, those numbers are phenomenal. It's so, and I'm assuming you have, so you mentioned you have an app. So on the app, do they communicate with each other? Or they communicate as a group or how does that app kind of work? Or does it have the functionality for both? It, it, so they communicate with each other in the house, right? So everyone who lives in the same pad split house room one through seven is on the same platform through the app. So they communicate directly to each other. If they want to submit a maintenance ticket, um, that's how they would communicate to you. Um, so they can click through the app and say, hey, you know, here's a maintenance ticket. This was submitted at this time by this member. Um, so that's how the communication works through the app typically. Oh, very cool. Whoops. Um, now tell me um, about like a couple of things 
um, well, first of all, we're talking about seven people, then I'll ask a few more things. So what happens if somebody stops paying? Like, what's that process? Like, how do we go? Do you guys handle eviction? Do we handle eviction? Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, we've learned through the years we've been operational how to mitigate eviction, right? No one wants to go through an eviction. So we have some processes that kind of eliminate that. Um, and, and what those are is our payments collection team being extremely bullish, right? So we're very flexible in the front end. If you need an extension to a week, if you need an extension to two weeks, we assess a late fee that goes directly to the investor. But then, it, you know, maybe someone's between jobs and they just need that little bit of buffer. Uh, typically, providing that flexibility allows them to get back on track. And it's worked in my uh, my properties multiple times. I've had people say, hey, I'm going to be late, you know, a week and I'll pay the late fee, but I need an extension and it's worked fine. Um, it used to be where we were so rigid that we didn't have that flexibility and that would result in people saying, well, screw it. I'll just, I'll squat on the property. And then we had to go the eviction process, right? We've actually reduced evictions about 40% um, through that alone. Now, the other thing we do is if someone is threatening to squat or, you know, you might have to evict someone, what we'll do is we'll send threatening texts, emails, and calls um, and really hound them and say, look, pad split is one of your last options. If you get kicked out of the pad split program, that's going to be on your permanent record, right? You're not going to be able to rent anywhere else. If anyone in an apartment or any other style, any other style like property management sees that, you know, you're not going to have an option. Usually that's enough to get them out of the house as well. If it goes to eviction, we don't have a magic bullet for that. Again, we can mitigate as much as we can on the front end. Um, and I've seen these processes work on my own behalf in my own houses. But if it does go to eviction, then it is processed through the courts like any other eviction. But we have processes to avoid that. So we try as hard as we can to. No, it's nice. Uh, we do have a question from a Facebook user. Um, I'll let you kind of go ahead and uh, read it out and then you can answer it. What is the criteria to add yes, a certain not. area that might not be currently offered by Pad Split? So I don't know if they're talking about specific locations like if they're talking about a non-core location of ours like uh, maybe another small town or another small city um it's a good question we do have a product called patswood anywhere where you can essentially turn on any asset in the nation what you don't get from that is the marketing piece that we provide so if you're comfortable with marketing you could still get the background checks payment processing use of the dashboard you still get everything but the marketing piece um, in order to open or launch a new area, we typically need to see 200 to 300 rooms, which is our unit counts, within a scheduled year. If we have that pipeline with investors, then we'll make it a strategic launch. Um, if not, then it would qualify for a pad split anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's good. So that's how you go into other markets. Like you just said, you just went into the Baltimore market? Mm -hmm. Yep. So what, so you had that. Okay, that's cool. And so what other, do you have anything that any markets that you guys are kind of looking at moving forward that's not on the map yet that you're looking at? Everything on the map is what we're going into currently. And, and they're not active yet, right? So we have Baltimore, Philly, which wasn't on the map, um, Kansas City and, and Miami are our newest, newest markets that we're launching this year. Um, so anything beyond that is kind of, you know, on the periphery. We're not strategically going in there. Um, and, and what I would say to the investor group is like the easiest way to utilize pad split if you're out of an area is to invest in a certain area. Right. So I live in Colorado. My money goes much further in the southeast. Pad splits functional there. It makes a lot of sense for me to take my money here and invest it in the southeast where pad splits actually functioning. Um, so that's that's my suggestion for out of state people. You know, instead of trying to force a, a square peg in a round but in a round hole, it's like why not just go to where the market is essentially. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Now let's talk about like you know the jurisdictions and like you know the codes and stuff like that and like you know because you have like seven seven bedrooms. What about seven parking cars out front? Let's let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, I'll address the parking issue. Uh, it's a great question. So what we do have with the technology and pads is the ability to lock off certain number of parking spots at a house, right? So my Atlanta property, I have seven people living there. I don't want seven cars in the parking lot. I don't want seven cars on the street. That doesn't look good in any neighborhood. You're going to have issues. So what we do is we can lock off the number at, say, four. Um, so what we do in our core markets is we can now directly advertise to people who drive vehicles. Once we fill those rooms up with four drivers, now we shut that off and we advertise to people who use public transit or Uber. 
So you're not wasting any marketing dollars and you're limiting the number of parking spots at your house, which I think is a fantastic feature um, that really doesn't you know, get talked about enough. I think it's a really cool piece of technology that we offer. Always good to think about parking. Um, you know, cul-de-sacs are hard because you can barely get two to three cars in a cul-de-sac. So it's good to think about parking. Um, you know, the more parking, the better, essentially. But you also don't want to have enough spaces and say, oh, I have nine spaces, so I want to have nine people here. You know, I think it eliminates problems kind of curbing the number of cars. Yeah, exactly. So that kind of makes sense. Now, what about like, um, you know, is a certain ordinance like, you know, how like some towns they don't they're, they're trying to push out Airbnbs. This is not an Airbnb model. Uh, it's more like why don't you kind of talk a little bit about that? Because I know that came up last time. Um, cause you, the, the contract, right. Is the rental contract with the, the investor is with us and, uh, your company, correct. And then you guys take care of the tenants. Is that how that works? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, in, in speaking to short-term rental laws, we, I've actually had a live, a lot of clients in, in areas all over the nation who are converting their short-term rental to pad split, um, because, you know, they're, they're cracking down and there's so much red tape with them. And, and the majority of that is time frame. Um, and also a lot of these short-term rentals were having parties that were very loud and obnoxious and, and pad split really isn't that model, right? Even though we have more people in a house, this is again, the workforce, you have people who are working different hours a day. It's not a party atmosphere. It's not a congregation atmosphere. It's very individualistic. Um, and properties tend to stay very quiet. Um, so what we do is we actually have a 31 day minimum as a standard than a weekly rate after that. Typically 31 days is long enough to, you know, get us out of any, short-term rental guideline. If you're in a property or if you're in an area like Tampa, for example, or I can't remember if it's four to six months for the short-term rental guidelines, we can actually extend our lease to whatever that number is. And the reason we can do that is our average tenure is actually 10.5 months per member in our program. Again, it's the workforce. Once they find an affordable place close to their work, they tend to stay a while. Um, so we have the flexibility to extend that if we need to, because on average, again, each tenant stays about 10 and a half months, um, which is really nice Got flexibility, it. right? Got it. So it's with uh, pad split is the agreement that we have, right? And that's where you're saying, so it's not the individual that's staying at the property for weekly rentals or whatever. But you're saying that in your agreement, they have to stay there first 31 days and then you switch it to a weekly. So they pay up front 31 days. Is that how that works? Um, I believe they still pay uh, weekly dues. They're 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 booked for 31 days, but the first week they pay their first week's due. We also have a move in fee assessed with each room. So if you have a property that goes live with seven bedrooms, you can essentially it, it's more or less you know the security deposit. People can price it out to 100 or 150 dollars. That goes directly to you. Um, so when you have a seven bedroom house go live, you're going to get that initial deposit of $700 from each people, each, each person that moved in. Every time you have a room flip um, and the room becomes active, that move in fee becomes active again, too. But to answer your question, weekly dues up front, even though it's a 31 day minimum weekly after that to provide some flexibility. Got it. OK, got it. So you mentioned something about, you know, people working nights and different shifts and stuff like that. Um, what about like somebody that wants to have their boyfriend or girlfriend come over and spend a night and hang out? Like how, how do you guys handle that? You know, we, we give hosts the ability to allow that essentially. Um, if you want to allow it, I think we have tools that will give you that power. We shy away from it as a company. Um, you know, it typically provides <laughs> problems, uh, you know, individual strangers might not fight in a house, but boyfriends and girlfriends, husbands and wives and partners tend to fight more. Um, so we try to stray away from it as much as we can. And in our house rules that are automatic, when you list your property, it says no, gu no guest allowed in a co-living uh, property. So we, we set that standard from the beginning and really shy away from that. Okay. That totally makes sense. Cause I could see, I can just imagine, you know, is that, you know, we we're all young at one time, but we are, you know, renting colleges and roommates and stuff like that. So, so it's kind of like that environment, but it's more for the workforce. I mean, it's probably even people at that age, but yeah. So the main people you want to make sure that it's like really near, um, you know, public transportation, as you mentioned, you know, and, uh, also, uh, a lot of times you said a lot of people tend to use Uber. They might, I mean, Uber's getting more and more popular. So public transportation, Uber is always good. High rental area, B and C class asset. Right. And you don't, and you also want to keep in mind, like you mentioned earlier, because I could see this, 
you, you know, some of these people are in the back of their head listening to this right now, like, oh, wow, I'm going to go get, I know, a six-bedroom home. But, you know, you're going to have an issue in that nice high-end neighborhood trying to create this model because all the neighbors and they're going to have some issues, I'm assuming, correct? Is that, is that Absolutely. Is that what I mean, happens? There's, there's no denying that. You don't want to be in an HOA. Essentially, HOAs in that association can change the rules at any moment. Um, there's sticklers about, you know, weeds growing in the front of your driveway, which is they serve a purpose, right? It's a necessary evil having an HOA. I live in an HOA. It's nice. But for co-living, you know, you don't want them throwing a lien against your house, right? If they don't like it, they're going to say no to it and you won't have an option essentially. So we don't want to be in HOAs. Got it. Okay. So we have another question here. Um, hi, is there a minimum of rooms to a house? Typically, we like to see five. Um, five would qualify for a traditional pad split. Anything less than that would be a pad split anywhere. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, really maximizing the space, three rooms is going to be close to what single family rent is. The more you grow that unit count and the more you operate through scale, the better your net profit's going to be. Short answer. So short answer is it's a minimum of a five. Um, but, you know, you like to be from five to eight. Seven's a sweet spot. Got it. Now, have you seen something where somebody may have like a duplex or triplex and they've converted each unit to add more? Have, yep. You know, have you ever seen that? Yeah, yeah. We have an Atlanta duplex that was, um, you know, just traditional duplex. They actually got 12 rooms out of it. Um, so six on each side, I think two or three bathrooms on each side, too. So multifamily does work well. Um, we also have some multifamily units in Vegas that they rent out individual suites. So it's a five unit complex. Um, they rent out each suite and they get a really, really good return for it. So that, that's another point. You know, if you're thinking about maximizing the space, you also want to think about private bathrooms. Private bathrooms go for a really good return on Padsplit and great occupancy. So when you're looking for assets or if you have assets, it's important to think uh, private bathrooms because those skyrocket your net profit. Got it. So and that's when you call them suites, then when they have their own bathroom. Is that how yeah. you is that what you call a suite? Or yeah, like the, the biggest ones I was alluding to have a private kitchenette and a laundry room. So that's a true, um, true suite. Um, but, you know, a master suite in a, a single family home, which is just a, a private bathroom. That's always great to look for. I have one on my Florida property. It's awesome. And do you do you ever go down and stay in these properties yourself if you're like in an area? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I went and visited the property. I actually had to get a new HVAC unit put on the Orlando one. Of course, it went out right before summer hit and I couldn't mess with that. So we had to get a $4,500 unit um, put on the house. So I went there and, and saw the work getting done. And I know some of the members and they're great people. You know, it's amazing to provide that, but it's also amazing to be able to, to communicate with them and, and see like, hey, you know, we're serving a good purpose here. There's a working class person. They like living here. You know, they're, they're keeping they look out for my asset too. So it's really cool to see that interaction. Nice. So, so you have to modify it. So I could like, cause I do a lot of like what's called sandwich lease option or seller financing strategy. So um, yeah, I could see this. The only thing you'd have to do is probably get some type of authorization from the seller that allow you to kind of modify the common area. So, which is probably no big deal. And then yeah. you just make it where they take it down if need be. Exactly. I think that's the selling point, right? You want to make sure the owner is very comfortable with what you're doing, but you can really sell them on that, you know, temporary solution of adding bedrooms, right? They are real walls, but they're temporary. We can take them down if there's any issues and, you know, not worry about it. But yeah, I, I would just make sure you're very comfortable with um with the op with the initial owner. And yeah, you can definitely utilize it. This is awesome. This is awesome. Well, I know uh, I'm going to post a link in here. I think I have the link because you mentioned that, uh, you know, people that are listening to this podcast or watching it um, will also post underneath that you mentioned something. Um, what was it that you were going to provide? Something like a, was it photos or something? I'm trying to remember when we talked last time before. There's a couple uh, of things. People who use yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things. So we do provide pre photos with a new, if you're a new host and you're putting, um, your asset on pad split or if you're acquiring an asset for your first one, we do free photography. Um, so it's a really, it'll save, you know, probably three fifty to $400 at the end of the process. We're partnered with professional photographers that can go do a fantastic job, send them directly to you. Um, and then, you know, availability for me. So like I provide access, I provide in information and guidance, right? Again, I'm your liaison for pad split. Um, so I provided uh, Mark with a link earlier, and this is, I put it in the chat too, uh, my meeting link. And essentially what that does is just give you a 10 minute phone call with me. We'll talk about your assets. We'll look how to acquire. 
just a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, deep process talk through of pad split just to make you be successful. Even if you want to learn more, um, it's definitely, you know, beneficial. Okay. Uh, so we got the link. I think it's the same link. I'm just going to go ahead and I see that you sent it over there. All right. Let me just make sure. I think it's the same one, but we'll put it there again. I think it's there twice now. So, well, Nick, anything else you want to touch base on this? I think this is great. It's always a pleasure. Anything else that we didn't ask or anything? No, I think we covered everything. It was a good in-depth look. Um, you know, I just think with the affordability crisis, that demand is, is only getting higher, right? The, the, the economy's shaky. There's a lot of inflation going on. Um, so you're essentially going to have a need that Pat's was addressing. Short-term rentals are getting weird. There's a lot of litigation that's cracking down on those. So the medium-term co-living workforce solution, I think, is really primed to, to skyrocket in the next couple of years. So everyone listening, Mark, I mean, you're really getting in um, early. You adopted this thought process really early, and you, you seem to like it. So, you know, if that's your mindset, um, I, I think you're trending in the right direction with what we're doing. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Again, happy to talk to you, happy to have a one-on-one -on -one sit down. Um, to exercise, you know, and, and give any information I can on the model. Um, and Mark, I want to yeah. find out how to get some more deals, man. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to like talk to you and, and figure out how to do some subject to or creative financing. Cause I'm trying to grow my portfolio. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, we, we have one right now, just before I got on the call, we're actually doing one in Idaho. Uh, we're doing a, an agreement for D same thing. Wow. We're just taking it. It's a, it's a five bedroom home, but it's in an HOA. So it wouldn't work for this model. So, uh, yeah. So, but thanks so much for coming on, Nick. And uh, we know we're going to sign off here, but you and I can stay at the end, chat briefly at the end. But you guys, thank you guys for listening. Um, again, if you like this, please share it with your friends, like it. And uh, Nick, thanks so much. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Everybody else, see you guys later. Thanks so much. This has been another episode of Real Estate Power Play, guiding real estate entrepreneurs to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or follow us on YouTube at Real Estate Power Play.